Our country is currently in the middle of a catastrophe. Every single day we burn countless litres of oil that catalyzes the destruction of our atmosphere, our economy, and even our public health. If we want to guarantee the sustainable future of New Zealand, it's a no-brainer that we must cut down on our consumption of oil. There is one reason I am standing before you today, and this is because I have a responsibility to tell you exactly how bad the problem of energy is in New Zealand. In order to do so, I have prepared three graphs from the Ministry of Business and Employment to spark our discussion. This first graph over here is a breakdown of energy demand in New Zealand by fuel over the past few decades. Please take a look at that disgusting streak of red and orange. That represents oil and gas. Look at it. It's half of everything in this entire graph. Half of all the energy we use in New Zealand in some way or form comes from oil and gas. Not solar, not wind, not hydroelectric, but oil and gas. If we go one step further and break the demand down by sector in New Zealand, it is painstakingly obvious that the, most, that the highest consumers of energy in New Zealand is the transport and industrial sector. And if I go one step forward, if I break down oil consumption, this pink and green here represents petrol and diesel. This tells me that 80% of all the oil and gas we use in New Zealand is petrol and diesel. I wonder what kind of machine uses petrol or diesel. What does this all mean? Well, half of all the energy we use is oil and gas. Two, the greatest consumer of oil and gas in New Zealand is transportation. Three, 80% of all the oil and gas we use in this country is due to cars. And the implications of this are actually immense. So it's a no-brainer that burning fossil fuels is harmful to our environment because we release toxic greenhouse chemicals. But petroleum combustion is a precursor to much more than just that. I mean, economic stability and declines in public health are also very real consequences of overusing this commodity. So economically, consider what would happen if an oil crisis significantly raised the cost of petrol in New Zealand. I'm going to tell you right now that we import over half the petrol we use in this country. So say the oil prices go up, it's going to be really hard for me to drive my car because I'm a poor, impoverished student. I mean, how can I, move, how can I drive from Auckland to Wellington, let alone go, go from my house to my future workplace every day? What does this mean for businesses? Well, the businesses will be less willing and able to distribute their goods and services across our country, and this will wound our economy. This is not a myth or a theory, but a proven example. Previous disruptions to New Zealand's oil supply has been catastrophic. So in the 1970s, we had a thing called the global energy crisis, and this caused a 10%, just a 10% increase in oil prices for New Zealand. And what happened next? Well, our country was plunged into a deep, dark recession for many, many years. To add insult to injury, vehicular emissions are responsible for creating the photochemical smog that causes innumerable respiratory illnesses in cities like Los Angeles and Beijing. If we continue to burn petrol at the rate we do, it's simply a matter of time before the clean green air we love is a relic of the past. Oops. Fortunately, there is a solution to, that can prevent these outcomes from severely affecting New Zealand. And it's this thing right over here. Isn't it beautiful? This is an electric car. With this thing, we can reduce our national oil consumption, mitigate economic vulnerabilities to oil supply fluctuations because they don't run on petrol. They're environmentally friendly. They reduce carbon emissions because no gasoline is burnt. There are health benefits. How can we create photochemical smog when we're not burning the stuff that causes that stuff in the first place? And finally, they, have, they, they boast low operating costs. Petrol is quite expensive and very low energy efficiency, but by using an electric car, it's actually cheaper for us to use an electric car than run a petrol car because we never have to do things like fix it because they hardly ever break down compared to most pieces of junk that are petrol cars. And, well, electricity is a lot more cost efficient than petrol. I'll go into this in a little bit more detail later. So, I actually know what you're all thinking. If these electric cars are so great, why aren't they already in widespread use? This is mainly due to two things, technological limitations and social limitations. 
I want to talk about the technological aspect with you first. So electric cars run on two things. A rechargeable battery and a motor, just like a normal car would run on petrol and an internal combustion engine. The main problem right now is that current battery technologies simply do not provide the vehicle range that is possible with petrol. To understand exactly why this is the case, we need to understand what a battery is. So a battery is a box with two conductive electrodes on each end. So that's that black stuff onto the blue bit and the red bit over there. And, it's con and they're connected by a wire and there's a li liquid called an electrolyte that separates those two things in the middle. When we connect the electrodes, those black things with a wire, electrons start flowing from the blue bit to the red bit. We call this electric current. This guy can power anything, from light bulbs to cars. <laughs> and well, to recharge a battery, we simply reverse the direction of electron flow by hooking it up with an external power source, such as solar panels or maybe our national grid. And this restores the battery to its original state. So most batteries, such as the lithium ion battery you see here, are limited for providing range for electric vehicles due to their high weight. And this is mainly due to the heavy carbon cobalt complexes, cobalt a heavy metal by the way, that is found in these lithium ion batteries. So imagine running with a rock on your shoulders compared to a feather. A battery can only store a given amount of energy per, per, per volume. And right now, with electric cars run on these batteries that we have right now, it's like running with a rock. It's absolutely exhausting and you just want to quit. And batteries are no different to us humans, it's exactly what happens. Fortunately, there are a number of alternative battery technologies that can benefit New Zealand by addressing this issue and provide better range than lithium ion batteries. And this is mainly done by reducing their weight. So over here, we have a salt lithium sulfur battery where we replace that, re that heavy blue component from the previous picture with sulfur. So the sulfur is that that not the lithium metal, but on the other side. That stuff is made of sulfur. And that stuff is lighter than lithium, so it's a bit more feather-like. And by creating a battery like this, we can create a battery that's cheaper and provides two to three times the range of, the range of standard lithium-ion batteries. But there's a, battery, there's a battery technology that I'm really excited about. And this is the lithium air battery. Now, this technology was invented in the 1970s as a potential source for electric vehicles. And as the name suggests, this is a battery that runs on air. So before we had lithium and carbon cobalt, and carbon cobalt was heavy, so we decided to replace it with sulfur, and it was a little bit better, right? This is the next step. We replace the sulfur with just air. That's right, the air we're breathing right now. Nothing, just air. The red stuff is just air. How incredible is that? Now, what this means is that these batteries are ridiculously light. It's, if the lithium ion battery is a boulder, this is a lightweight feather. And because these batteries are so light, they're capable of providing electric vehicles with a range 10 to 15 times those of normal lithium ion batteries. And to give you a sense of what that means, it's just as good as petrol, if not better. Unfortunately, these batteries are far from perfect. They suffer from a problem of poor lifespan. And what I mean by lifespan is best illustrated if I had my phone with me right now, which I don't. But so. So I use my phone, it's flat, I recharge it. It's called that one cycle. After a thousand cycles, we'll maybe notice that it only lasts three hours when it used to last the whole day when I first bought it. This is exactly what I mean by lifespan. So the problem with lithium air battery cars is that their lifespan decreases far too quickly. And scientists think this has something to do with the electrode, the, the, the electrolyte, the, or and electrode, it's actually both, it's actually a combination of the two that we find in these batteries. So they degenerate far too quickly. So the holy grail of research in this area is to find the right combination of electrode and electrolyte to make these lithium air batteries last a very, very long time. Please keep that in mind. I'm going to talk about this in a bit more detail in a later section. I now want to move on to the social limitations of electric car development. And foremost, I want to begin by stating that electric cars are actually no modern invention. So let's just take a guess. When do you think electric cars were invented? Dr. Dickinson? Oh, OK, sorry. <laughs> All right. Yeah, they've actually been around since the 1900s. And back then, we lived in this utopian age where neither electric nor petrol cars were suitable for mass production. So if we could go from a 12-second flight by the Wright brothers 
to a landing on the moon by Neil Armstrong in 66 years. Why haven't, really, why haven't we gone anywhere with electric cars in the past 100? The only reason petroleum cars are so developed today is because 100 years ago, the major development for petrol cars happened first. This encouraged all these big companies like Ford to invest in these cars because they want to make more money and stay in the game and continue to make profits. So they completely forgot about these electric cars, which seemed terrible at the time because petrol was so much more efficient and effective. And this completely halted electric car technology development. The key point to make here is that significant advancements in electric car technologies are not impossible, but just that relatively few people have worked on advancing this technology compared to the number of people that have worked on normal cars. So there are a few companies here and there, like Tesla Motors or General Motors, I'm sure you've heard of them, who work in the United States towards improving electric vehicles, but this industry is actually still fair game. Unlike a normal petrol car monopoly that's run by places like Toyota and Ford. And this is exactly where New Zealand comes in. So please recall what I said about New Zealand being a net importer of petroleum. Our national market conditions are simply screaming at us to move into electric cars. They're more reliable, cost-efficient, environmentally friendly, and give us the added benefit of taking our economic future into our own hands. I don't see any reason why we should let this opportunity pass us by. We have a proven track record of incredible scientists like Rutherford, Callan, McDiarmid, and they've each changed the world with their innovations. This is another such opportunity. Even today, New Zealand companies and scientists have shown me that they're capable of becoming world leaders in battery technology. One such example of a group of scientists is Anzo, a manufacturer and distributor of a novel kind of zinc battery that was invented right here at Massey University. So remember what I said about the major technological challenges of lithium air batteries being finding that holy grail, that Goldilocks material of electrolyte and electrode, right? Well, what if we started focusing on that? I mean, if we were to focus on that challenge and succeed, we would take a small step for the electric vehicle industry, but take a ginormous step for the future of mankind. I mean, I know for a fact that New Zealand the laboratories have the facilities required to carry out this research. Well, I mean, with an NMR spectroscope, X-ray diffraction machine, and electron microscope, which are all common devices in the, in the New Zealand lab, it's possible to, div to evaluate the suitability of these materials for use in cars. So what I want to stress now is that the destination is wonderful. The destination is a utopia where we all run on electric cars that could potentially be run on solar energy, but the journey is quite exciting as well. If we research electric vehicle technology, we can create jobs for New Zealanders, we can boost our international reputation as a technological pioneer, we can ensure the low cost of electric cars in New Zealand because people want to use our technology, and we raise the public awareness of electric cars. People are like, yeah, rugby, yeah, rowing, yeah, electric cars. <laughs> and, of course, last but not least, we will help New Zealand become a truly, truly sustainable country. This is the future I envision, this is the future you can envision, and this is the future we can all accomplish. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Richard. Can, are you convinced that we could supply clean energy for a national fleet of electric cars? Excuse me, a clean energy for an international fleet? National. National fleet. Um, I don't think change, Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, it will really depend on how this technology progresses in the next few years. I think it's a step in the right direction. Maybe one day we'll have enough clean energy to run all these cars, but... Because um, there's not much point. You put in your car before you... What's it, aren't you? There's not much point having electric cars if we're still burning stuff to fuel them. I was really hoping you would ask me that question. <laughs> Good. I'm happy to okay, oblige. Okay, okay, So, okay, how, how do I explain this? So let's just take... It's a, it's a big step in the right direction, and this is what I want to emphasize. So say we use... Forget coal. Say, say, say gasoline. To make gasoline, you've got to take it to a refinery and put all this energy in, release all these crazy side chemicals to get the gasoline. And even, and even if we get the gasoline, um, burning is not a very energy efficient way to generate power. So they're only about like, like uh, combustion is only about 40% efficient. But if you say we just burnt a whole lot of gas, which burns a little bit cleaner than the gasoline production process, and we use that gas to generate electricity, which powers our electric vehicles. Um, we become a lot more cost efficient in terms of both carbon emissions and cost. Does that make sense? So it's not a silver bullet that just magically kills the demon of unsustainability, but it's a huge step in the right direction. So if we were going to end the world by, say, 2100, the way we're going right now, by switching to electric cars, maybe the world will end in 2300, if that, 
answers your question. <laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> um, do you think that there might be a few other very well-funded companies looking for exactly what you're suggesting that New Zealand should be investigating? Well, I guess there is. So uh, if you look into some leading US research universities like Stanford, MIT, they sort of have interest in these things. But surprisingly, I haven't seen any big commercial interest in these things. So I have read that the vehicle industry is um, interested. But if they were really interested, we'd be able to read it on the front pages of their websites, which is clearly not the case. I still think that this industry is really fair game for us to take part in and seize for ourselves. And that's just my own personal opinion. Is the cost of a Tesla largely the battery? Yes, yes. That's uh, why it's so expensive. That's why it's so expensive. So what they're doing is they're trying to play the supply and demand game by buying this thing called the Gigafor. They're making a Gigafactory where they mass produce built like thousands and billions of these lithium ion batteries to drive the price down. But um, like lithium, I might be distracted from your question, but yeah, it is mainly the battery. But the good thing about the lithium air batteries that I was talking about is that it'll be a lot cheaper to make because I don't need the cobalt, I don't need the cobalt anymore. I just have a lithium and some sort of stable electrolyte electrode and it just runs off the air surrounding it. Presumably so that, there, are, yeah. there are limited sources of lithium though, aren't there? Well, there's a limited source of everything, to be, to be perfectly honest. It's a very good point you raise. Um, I had a discussion about this with my friend the other day. Um, science, it's, it's not a one-man army. You've got to have, if I do one thing, I've got to have my colleagues doing something else to support what I'm doing. So what I mean by that is, sure, we're going to run out of silicon, we're going to run out of lithium, we're going to run out of oil and gas. But to address that lithium, the lithium issue that you just talked about, um, there are some groups that are interested in, say, asteroid mining to replenish our supplies of lithium. So what asteroid mining is, you just take an asteroid and you extract the lithium out of it. <laughs> but, so it's too technical for me. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's the kind of, to, to, the, to address issues like that, that's the kind of line of thought that scientists are having these days, and I would have to agree with that personally. Thank you. Yeah.